music is said to stir the soul does that even apply if it was created by a machine when we give machine values and it's also calculation for us that's simply computing when we give a machine data and it learns from its experiences and then makes recommendation that's artificial intelligence so what happens when we give ai one of the most human of art forms music quite a bit as it turns out right hello everyone welcome to analytics insight podcast this is priya dialani your host so over the years technology has played a key role in shaping the music industry consider the progression from the photograph and analog tape machines to digital recording software and internet based streaming services the past two decades of rapid innovation in digital technologies have particularly disrupted the music business at every level now one such segment that we are going to focus today is the global rights management service for music and for this we have founder and ceo paul goldman of muzerk hi paul how are you doing good how are you thanks for having me thank you so much i'm doing good too Okay so um let's start with knowing more about uh, the company music seems quite interesting so we would want to know about um the company its specialization and the services it offers uh sure so uh music is a is a technology driven global rights administration platform for music and video we focus on using new technologies to solve the problem of finding and collecting artist royalties in the new digital landscape So for example YouTube Spotify Apple Music um those types of platforms that we all all, all use um and also emerging new platforms that are popping up for example like TikTok which is probably the most recent uh platform that's really scaling. Uh and this problem you know is new it's been a problem since really the laws of copyright have been put into law at least in the United States over 100 years ago actually. Um and again we do this really focus on proprietary our proprietary technology platform which we call Blue Matter which discovers lost and unclaimed royalties that in the past have been left behind on the floor. Great um this this sounds quite interesting uh, Paul and um we would definitely want to know more about it. Um but um when you're talking about it, different technologies and uh, uh specifically into the global rights management service um i i believe digital technologies uh, led to growth in the music industry at first then came napster so the internet became advanced enough that users could share and download music online um pirating music no longer demanded dubbing tapes and burning cds so people could download virtually any song they wanted through file sharing platforms and that too for free So this 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 quite has been a uh, been a progression of um uh, technology in the music industry. So we want to know uh, what has been your role in the company and your contribution towards um the company as well as the industry overall. Sure. So my my role as CEO and founder. Um just a little bit of a background because it has some DNA into music. For 20 years I was a composer for television and uh, owned a production music company and we wrote music for television commercials and TV shows. And one day I realized after 20 years of writing some of the biggest shows in the world I wasn't receiving any royalties and I didn't even know I needed to receive those. Um so Usurp was born out of the idea that I lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in royalties and when I went to the rights organizations who were supposed to be collecting these and the TV networks who were supposed to be submitting these they told me for the past 20 years they have no data on me at all. Uh so that kind of spawned the idea of music. So the contribution we give to the industry or what what our our focus and goal is is to take an old outdated system that was let's say analog and move it into the digital ecosystem. So artists and copyright holders and people who have money coming to them can get connected to their money. Now this used to be done on a regional scale. Like in the United States if you're an artist in the United States most of your stuff was used in the United States it was very easy to see like which record stores sold your sold your albums and where you toured but now with the global platforms you can imagine that if you're an artist in any country and you put it on a platform like Spotify there are people listening to it from all over the world there can be multiple owners on one track you can be a US citizen and work with someone in uh in India in Europe and Asia as a producer and their money's supposed to go there so the global shattering of this system is what we're trying to fix and connect and really we're we're focused on the money flow that's really where our core focus is um 
and and that's um and that that's where we feel the the contribution uh, is going towards the company. Um, and we need to you know we really need to modernize this. The music industry is a little behind because like you you brought up Napster. When Napster launched, the music industry went crazy into a crazy kind of war mode, if you remember. They went into major lawsuits. They actually did shut down Napster. Uh, they went into a big mode of trying to sue companies, threaten them. And if we look at parallel, the movie industry, when they went digital, uh, let's say 10, 10 years ago, the movie industry actually got on board with the digital uh, landscape. They didn't fight it. They actually developed new technologies. I mean, we have Hulu, we have Netflix, um, many other streaming platforms in, in other countries as well. And the fact that we can even watch movies on airplanes mean that they had their licensing programs together and they rediscovered. I mean, who goes to movie theaters? I mean, pre-COVID, take that out of it, but who goes to movie theaters anymore? So they knew this and look at the landscape. The problem with the music industry is they didn't take an adoption approach 10 years ago and they decided that we were going to fight this thing and keep people in this uh, and not move forward. But what they soon realized that as the, as the world was passing them by and these technology platforms were advancing so fast, like YouTube, faster than they can even keep up, that they better change their views. And they have. And they said, look, now we're going to be partners with you. We're going to license our music freely. We're actually going to invest. We're going to own parts of your companies instead of sue you and try to stop you. The problem is they're a little behind. So, you know, I would say they're five years behind and also updating, let's say, you know, in a layman's term, updating their systems, moving them from analog to digital. And because copyright is so seeped in different laws, each country has very strict copyright laws that they can't reinvent certain things. They still have to apply laws that could be 80 years old, 90 years old in some cases in the United States into the digital ecosystem. So there are a lot of restrictions and parameters. So this is kind of what we're trying to as our contribution, uh, you know, be that, you know, not necessarily a Band-Aid, but almost like an adapter plug. Uh, because we have to carry some of the legacy things into the new. We can't just build a new system from scratch. It just doesn't work that way in the music industry, which which creates the challenge. Okay, I think um, I, I was really not aware about such restrictions and the challenges that the music industry is facing. And thank you for letting us know that there are different set of challenges um, that the industry is facing and how uh, you and a company music is trying to solve uh, those problems and make sure that um, we, uh, uh, the music industry is also advancing um, uh, in terms of uh, different technologies as well as um, in, in competing with different industries who are already paving their way um, towards digital transformation and um, embracing different technologies to be competitive. Um, so, um, uh, if you talk about different uh, music streaming services like uh, Spotify or Apple Music, um, they employ different vectors, um, including rhythm, genre, and user geography, to suggest new songs to their clientele. Now, recommendation AI does this in part by queuing songs from playlists created by other users who share your musical taste, uh, maybe something known as collaborative filtering. So, um, we want to know that uh, what are your views on the current global streaming music video royalty landscape? Sure. Um, so the, the problem is really for us because we specifically work in really the copyright ownership and think of us as like a fintech or financial institution of clearing the money, not so much on the creative side of AI. What a lot of people think of AI technology and music, they would think of what you just explained, like uh, recommend recommendation engines, or you like this type of music, you might like this. We really work on the, uh, the, the getting, um, the financial side of it, which is the most important part, because when you see an artist, they make their, this is how they get paid and this is how they really powers the engine. So the problems that really been identified, people have been talking about this for a long time. And it's now just finally with companies like music and other companies in our sector that it's really, uh, we're really starting to deal with them and we're starting to look forward. Um, you know, navigating challenges really for publishers and writers is really a clear focus of ours. That's kind of the core of the people that own copyright. Uh, the complexities of the streaming space is unique to publishers and writers. Much of it relies on rights holders identifying where their songs exist and are being played. In other words, where their products are being sold. For example, if you submit your music to Spotify, which you can essentially uh, do for free, it then goes to Spotify, and you don't really know who's listening to it. 
right? You own this. You technically own the copyright. You own this music. People can be listening to it all over the place. Spotify is streaming it in every region they can globally and expanding. Um, this is very unique to the music industry that the owner doesn't know where their music's being sold, how much money it's making, how to get that money. And it's not being delivered to them unless they are proactive and go get it. I mean, if you think about it, what other industry does this? I mean, can you imagine a company like Procter Gamble that makes, you know, thousands of products that we all use in, in our households with a warehouse where anyone could go to the warehouse, take as much as they want, sell it in their stores, um, and, and, and Procter & Gamble has no idea where it's been sold and has to go out and figure that out for themselves. I mean, that's just, it's, it's kind of crazy, but that is essentially how the music industry is structured from a copyright holder's perspective. That's why you see a lot of articles about artists feel left out. They feel like they're fighting for their money and they do. And it's not many industries where people have to go uh, fight and go find their money. I mean, can you imagine working at a company where every month when you were to go pick up your paycheck, you had to go figure it out, fight for it, prove it, and then they would give you less of what you earned and you would have to somehow figure out how to get more. So this is like a, an inherent problem in, in, in that industry that's really focused on publishers and writers. And of course, it's also um, um, some of the royalty landscape, which we're focused on, which is really cool, is like the new emerging platforms. It's not all about DSPs, about streaming music. It's also platforms like TikTok, like Peloton, for example, you know, which is people don't think about that. But, you know, um, I don't know if every country has Peloton, but it's, it's, it's an at home uh, exercise bicycle that's really popular here in the States. Um, and people buy these, they put them in their home and they have like an on screen uh, on demand where you can kind of work out virtual with a live class instead of going to the gym. And this plays a lot of music, a lot of music. In fact, they've been they've been in a couple of lawsuits already using music that um wasn't licensed. I think they were settled, but but it's a, but those are platforms too that that need to be considered. And then we have these new markets, which is very cool, which are the new emerging markets like India, like Asia, and like certain parts of Europe that aren't really developed, where Spotify and these other platforms are just going into. I mean, it, it's actually predicted that the U.S. could end up being the third largest market in the world once India and Asia develop uh, just by population. And once they have access to Western music and streaming applications. So it's really it's really just the beginning. A lot of people think the music industry uh, has been in this a while, but we see it as very much in the beginning because, you know, the platforms that are emerging now, uh, when we look back 10, 20 years from now, I mean, there's going to be so many new types of TikToks, new types of Pelotons, even new types of YouTubes and maybe new Spotify's uh, that will that will emerge. And, and you know, and, and who knows? It's, it's a kind of a crystal ball. Definitely. I think uh, uh, with, with so much advancements in technology and new innovative solutions coming up, we definitely can expect more and more um, kinds of Spotify's and uh, different platforms um, where um, uh, streaming music or even like uh, managing um, the royalty landscape would, would be easier. And uh, would, that would that would help the entire music industry overall. Um so uh, musicians and music businesses um, have had to diversify revenue streams in creative ways to make up for lost sales. So this was this is more apparent when we are talking about where uh, each industry was turning to digital transformation or are adopting digital technologies to to have an edge. So similarly, musicians and music businesses also also found a way um, to how they can make up for the lost sales. For example, the live music industry has always been an important source of income for performers, audio engineers, venues, promoters, and, and other professionals involved in the entire um, uh, live music session. So many people in the music industry began to focus more on live music as a digital era uh, decimated album sales. So before the COVID-19 hit, live music saw steady growth over the last two decades. And during the pandemic, musicians have been monetizing live stream performances over social media platforms, um, using donation links or paid access services. So this is one such aspect that uh, we are talking about how um, the industry is taking steps of, uh, towards di digital transformation. So uh, since we're talking about uh, the management of the global music streaming, uh, we would want to know how do you think artificial intelligence is playing a role here? Sure. Um, so particularly for rights management, um, which I'll talk about, obviously, uh, you know, AI is allowing 
for companies like Muser to perform extremely complex computations against huge data sets faster and more accurately for very specific data sets than anything we've had before. Um, so think about, for example, uh, let's just say Spotify. If you take their entire data set for the month of every click that happened, a company like Muser or any company that has access to that has to siphon through that. Now you're getting usage from different countries that has that input of their data in different language sets. I mean, you know, people's spellings of names from other countries are completely all over the place, uh, things like that. But can you imagine if you don't have a system that can go through hundreds of millions of lines of data over and over and over and over again in a day to improve the AI, how do you even start? So that was the problem a few years back. So Musurk's technology moves this forward, and this is really the big um, crux of it. So at Musurk, we have one of our software tools that sits under our Blue Matter umbrella is called MMatch, and it uses AI to calculate in real time the best matching algorithm for a particular data set and apply that at scale you know, across data sets ranging from 10,000 lines in size all the way to hundreds of millions of lines in size. I'll give you an example. We have customers from all over the world. So when we get a data set from our Japanese uh, customers, some of it's in, it's in Japanese characters, and there's different types of Japanese characters. So our, our AI technology has to understand the, that data set. If we get it from Spain, if we get it from Italy, if we get it from India, if we get it from Malaysia, wherever. So you kind of get the point. It's not just about typing in someone's name. There's languages, there's spellings, and that's just the first level of it. So we utilize this technology to match uh, incoming data sets from clients to what we call like DSP identifiers, reconcile the broken usage data, because a lot of the data is broken, just like when we use our mortgages or our banks and we get these emails about, did you live here 10 years ago? Did you live there? Is that you? Uh, we also have to, um, a lot of our data has missing, missing gaps in it. So when we do find those missing gaps, we go to update it. Now our customer's data has been updated across many platforms for the future. It's been, it's, it's been made better. And we solve many of these challenges at large scale uh, and large scale rights management. Muzerk right now manages almost, well, over 5 million works and reaching 6 million next month. So we're managing that many uh, pieces of works for us into these data sets. So we're not only going through hundreds of millions of lines in their data set, we're also scanning against almost 6 million lines as of today in our data set. So you can see how AI is, is almost a crucial step. I mean, we talk about it internally. Without AI technology, there's, there's no way to do this. You, even even 10,000 humans couldn't do what our AI system does. I mean, and, you know, and I know your audience is familiar with AI, so they understand the, the generality of what I'm saying. Definitely. Well, thank you um, so much for uh, giving such a comprehensive um, information about how AI is uh, solving the problem of uh, global music streaming management. Um, also, I think um, recently you have been stealing a lot of limelight in terms of new partnerships and collaborations. So we want to know more from you and uh, the future prospects of this partnership as well. So can you brief us about um, uh, Blue Matter and how your recent partnership uh, with La Love Button is helping you and, and, and your company? Yeah, this is a great question. I, I love talking about this. So, um, so first I'll talk about Blue Matter, and then I'll kind of add in the uh, explain a little bit about the laugh button um, because I mentioned Blue Matter a little bit. So, Blue Matter is our proprietary technology platform. It's a combination of all our proprietary cloud software in one hub. So we call the whole thing Blue Matter, um, and from custom built data management tools for our rights management team, like automated client data ingestion and matching via tools, which is CWR and MMatch, um, our automated detection of internal conflicts between clients works uh, and resolves all these conflicts. Um, it's all fully automated, has an end-to-end -end automation. So Blue Matter is really the driving force behind all our technology. Uh, the system is contextually um, uh, aware um, it spins up cloud resources on demand to handle that load, spinning them back down when the jobs are finished. Um, all of this is reported back to the platform. So internal end 
users can action on this data and spend their time doing important parts of rights management. So the Blue Matter thing is kind of cool because it's a new customer of ours, and um, it's not our typical, it's part of this new emerging rights platform. Of course, we manage music. Um, of course, we're managing video. Uh, but the Laugh Button is a, is a podcast network. So the Laugh Button produces comedy podcasts. Um, there's a lot of, you can check it out. Um, I'm not sure what the URL is, but if you Google laugh button, so they're, ba they're, it's podcasting. So that's part of the new emerging, emerging rights we talked about. Um, maybe I didn't include it early, early in our conversation, but I should have. So podcasting, it's not music, it's not video, but it is audio and it is copywritten. So it's what we call spoken word. So spoken word is comedy. It's also podcasting. It's things that are not musical. And when these platforms stream them, and they stream a lot of it, uh, it, it, it generates a royalty. So there's, so, so then Musirc has, has an action to go, go provide a service for us. So the, la I'll just, so the laugh button, uh, produces comedy podcast and, uh, we manage their rights on YouTube right now. And what is interesting is their needs span further than those of the music industry and traditional entertainment. Podcasters really depend on an accurate play count and an audience size in order to establish their value to advertisers because podcasters uh you know have advertising on there and they set that rate by how much uh views they get not just royalties so for them being able to count every play whether they originate on their official platform or someone for example is borrowing their podcast or putting it on another platform um the youtube space is very important so we're able to provide them with again not just royalties which is what we originally did but in this new emerging landscape, we realize, wow, podcasters need some other data attached with that too, not just the money, but they also need to know view counts. And sure, artists want to know view counts, but they just want to know those because they want to know how their audience is. They don't necessarily relate that to an advertiser on their channel, but podcasters enlist their own advertising. I mean, when you hear podcasters, it may be, I don't know if you guys are sponsored or you guys do advertising, but the first two minutes will say, this podcast is sponsored by so-and-so. Um, that's what we're talking about. They're selling that advertising themselves. It's not through YouTube. So uh, they basically say, hey, look, we have you know, a million views a month. This is our rate. We have two million views. Our rate is higher. So it's been interesting now in these new emerging markets to see how Musirc's product is also um, evolving as well. That seems like a very um, powerful uh, collaboration and a valuable collaboration. And uh, we really hope that this collaboration helped you uh, streamline more of your efforts in terms of um, uh, streaming management, music streaming management. Um, apart from that, we also want to know, uh, well, well th this was one such key partnership, but um, are there any other involvements or any other partnerships that you have uh, done and that that makes your company more innovative or any such thing that you would like to highlight that that makes you different sure um so there's a couple partnerships and then i'll talk a little bit about what makes the uh the technology kind of different so there's a couple interesting partnerships besides obviously we have a lot of customers in the music space um we have a partnership with spoken giants and spoken giants is a um is the first CMO Right Society for Spoken Words and Podcasting. Um, and they discovered that with this new landscape of comedy being played, even on the radio and uh, podcasting being done, that really these platforms like Spotify, XM Radio, which is really um, popular in the United States where people listen to a lot of comedy when they're in their cars, they realized that they really didn't have a right society to send it to. Like in, in the music space, if you take the United States, you would send the money to ASCAP or BMI for the most part. Um, if you're in Japan, you'd send it to JazRAC. If you're in India, you send it to IPRS. These are the right societies. But what this group identified is there's really no society to send it to. So they're kind of, I wouldn't say they're holding the money, but they're, and they want to send the money out. There's just not a pipeline set up yet because it's so, it's so new, new and emerging. So uh, music is part part owners of that actually, uh, and we also administer the rights. So that's how we get into these spaces like the lap working with the lap button. And by the way, part of the spaces we're literally laying the new roads here. Like the roads have never been laid before. So some, so this is very innovative. Just like how I explained that we didn't even understand that podcasters would value their play count, which has nothing to do with passing the royalties. It's just about we actually process a lot of data and can provide that for them. 
uh, we're learning a lot, but it's definitely a new and emerging market. Um, the other interesting partnership we have is a partnership with a company called Video Research in Japan. Um, and this is, a, this is really to enter into the Japanese market. We're already heavily in the music market with clients like Jazzrack, which is their, their, uh, their performance rights organization. But Video Research is a company that handles, uh, they're the largest video metric company in Japan. And we're going and we're, the partnership is being developed to provide video rights management for the networks of Japan. The networks of Japan have been very closed off. They want to get into the global landscape. Their videos are everywhere out in the world now. People love anime. They love the cooking shows. They love travel shows. And they don't really have a system in place when the content leaves the island of Japan to manage it. Now, we do it well in the United States and in Europe because we've been doing it for 10 years. So this is a really cool partnership, uh, uh, a joint venture company, actually, between uh, Muser and Video Research. It's called Muser VID. And uh, we formed it a few months ago uh, in the middle of the pandemic. We were working on it beforehand. And now we're just getting the product going. So that's going to be very interesting. Um, so those are two cool just business development partnerships. Um, let me talk just a little bit about how we think you know, Muser, our technology is innovative in, 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 a, in a general sense. So, you know, we think we're innovative. Muser is innovative because we've taken a technology first approach to servicing the industry. You know, we've really said, look, we, we are not going to be a music company. We're not a label. We're not a publisher. We don't deal with artists. We really have to take a technology approach to solving this industry because this industry needs a very specific type of technology because it's very niche. Sure, you can. There's other uh, industries with data. I mean, look at banking; they have huge data sets as well. Huge, but music industry needs very specific algorithms, very specific data sets attached to different laws that are associated with copyright. So it needs a very customized, uh, customized technology. So we've really set out to hire technologists from outside fields that have dealt with big data problems. Uh, we haven't hired inside the music industry. We've hired people who have backgrounds in. Gen gen uh, Gen genomics, banking, cybersecurity, uh, military logistics, you know, to really bring outside people in and say, hey, look, this is the problem. You don't have to be a musician to work at Muser. You don't even really have to like music. You just have to understand how to connect its, its, the data uh, and, and, and be a technology-focused company. So we really set out to build a state-of-the-art modern technology uh, with today's best development practices and technologies at the forefront of development. So larger, older companies have so much red tape to deal with, as we all know in any industry, when building new software with huge legacy code bases. I mean, we see it all the time where huge companies, we see it at hospitals, at banks, where they've been around forever. And you'd say, why is their website so bad? Why is the mobile app so bad? This is one of the biggest billion dollar companies in the world. How hard is it to hire, you know, they could spend tens of millions of dollars and easily build better tech solutions. But one of the problems is they do have legacy code uh, and they just can't rewrite everything. So music is like the opposite of this because we're, you know, we're not brand new, but we're considered new. We're four years old and we're building truly modern and scalable technology all in the cloud uh, with data processing management practices uh, that are taken from several outside industries that have already solved similar problems that we face every day in the music industry. And then putting them specifically to rights management. So again, for example, there's a lot of things we do that people do in banking. We don't have to reinvent that. They do it in insurance. If you're, um, again, I don't know, but in the United States, if you're at, with an insurance company for, for your medical hospital, you have these apps now that, you know, you can do everything online with your bill paying and seeing your, your test results and things like that. So we try to take some of those things and we don't need to reinvent the wheel on those things. And then specifically, customize them for this complicated rights management space. And I, and I really think, again, when we use the word innovative at the company, we don't really talk about, oh, we made this awesome algorithm, this beautiful algorithm that solves a problem. It's really more of a holistic approach that we think makes the company innovative. Well, definitely it feels, yeah, music is, is quite innovative in terms of how you're leveraging technology and um, how you're trying to solve um, uh, the, the music streaming management um, uh, uh, sector or the field of the entire music industry. Um, 
so um while we're talking about uh, different technologies that are playing a role in the uh, in the music uh, industry um the digital music revolution inarguably hurt music industry giants in terms of sales so it it also uh, level the playing field between big music businesses and smaller ones like indie record labels um advancements in home recording software allowed musicians to record at a very low cost and even digital distribution platforms also let artists and small label side uh, side step larger industry controlled distribution channels so um while there there have been pros of uh, digital uh, technologies there are cons as well so we want to know if there are any challenges that you came across and how did you overcome such challenges sure um look the, the big challenge here you know and this is what obviously this podcast is about and this is what we're about it is technology right this is this is the big challenge at least for what we do uh some of the things you mentioned like develop artist development and how people can create music at home now with kind of at home software and things like that um that's on the creative side but on this financial side that we work on it's again the technology uh and and i could say that you know music has been built music has built some really complex and scalable solutions for moving data from a huge number of different endpoints to others while performing analysis and value extraction in between this has been incredibly challenging again it gets back to that theme we talked about in uh previously in this podcast which is it's 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 data it's moving these massive scalable chunks of data the data's not that great uh it's 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 not corrupted but it's incomplete it comes from all over the world the quality control and then you have to match it and work with a huge data set from a billion dollar public company like Spotify or YouTube and you can see where the mismatch happens so this has been really incredibly challenging but we've overcome these challenges by continuing to put value in our technology teams actually again more of a holistic approach really integrating tech into rights management our rights management professionals really have a you know a go getter attitude in exploring these skill sets when it comes to technology and and furthering their education and skill development to learn new skills that have helped music get to where we are today um while the technology team has been building out you know automated tools uh to better their own jobs i mean we have technologists and internal uh when we do uh reporting when we're paying the money out we find that hey we're having a hard time doing this so the technology team starts building internal tools they it's this it's this super end to end solution again after we find the royalty let's say we find the money we're looking for and that went well we then still have to take in the data we still have to process the data like i said we have almost 6 million works so that's tied to thousands of different endpoint customers which we then have to deliver money to transfer money around the world to bank accounts with quality reporting which has not been done in the past meaning um transparent explaining where all your money is explaining what percentages are there how we found it um and you know essentially music's commitment to being a technology first company from the top of the company down has been our key to success in overcoming the challenges that come with building modern scalable technology in this industry because what we're doing hasn't really been done before so we can't just say hey we're going to hire this key technology uh technologists from the best company in the world and they're going to just come and we're going to pay them a ton of money and they're going to do what we need to do. It doesn't work that way in the music industry. There are things we're doing and we mentioned like TikTok and these other companies they don't even have their full rights management program built out yet. They're not even fully paying people because it's it's not it's not about whether they want to and they're not trying to steal money. The the roads have not been built yet. They're being dug up and we're building them. and once these roads are built future future things will come and use them but we're really in an innovation step here where even the companies that are trying to do the right thing sometimes we get stuck because we then say well we need to get over that mountain there's no road so now we're going to have to build a tunnel through the mountain and no one ever built it before so it's going to take us a little longer to do the first tunnel but once the first tunnel's done everyone else can use it so 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 we really have to focus on hiring the right minds the right thinkers the right like like i said like go getter attitude because in our business if people get discouraged cuz they keep getting roadblocks it's not it's not the industry to be in because that's all our business is is about getting over a roadblock and then we're literally looking for the next roadblock cuz we want to basically smash it 
you know, we want to like plow through it. We know they're up there and we're looking, where's the next roadblock so we can fix it, get rid of it, clear the road, so to speak. I hope that makes sense. I, I truly admire this um, a never to give up attitude where you're talking about that you're looking forward to a roadblock where you can overcome that and create a solution for that as well. So it seems, seems quite in, inspiring and um, I hope our listeners would also um, um, make sense of it. And um, if there's anyone who is interested in the music industry, you know, uh, I think that this, this would be very much valuable for them as well. So one last question for you, and that would be, uh, what are your views on the uh, future of technology in music streaming and the overall music industry? Sure. Uh, big question, but I'll try to make the answer short <laughs> and sweet. <laughs> um, look, if we look, if we look at the industry as music production, again, I'm not going to talk about you know, how Jay-Z or Beyonce, that's, that's a different sector of music. And of course, that's the part that we all love, the consumption and the fun part and the art part. But if we look at, again, what music does and we look at the industry as music production, as music consumption and music administration. So you have making the music, like the labels, discovering the artists. You have music consumption, which is then people, fans listening to it and consuming it. And then you have music administration. Technology has and will continue to influence all of these greatly. I mean, we're seeing things through the COVID, um, this COVID year or years. Um, and I, yes, it's been a struggle, I mean, for people in life, for sure, through COVID. The music industry hit a little bit of a low in the live music kind of a kind of a uh, sector. But, you know, as a company, we're constantly predicting what we do to our investors, to our partners. Like, hey, like you're asking me, what do you see the future as? We, we can change our mind, but we need to have a vision. Um, and really, what we envisioned in five years is now going to happen in two years. And, and I'm not saying COVID is a good thing, because I wouldn't trade this, but COVID essentially sped this up. It forced the digital age, and I'm sure other industries felt it, and it took that knob and it cranked it. Um, I would say most attention has been currently given to production. Like you mentioned a couple of questions ago, recording software, cloud-based production tools, content licensing. So giving any musician the idea that they can make music even in their house and make good music. And they could cheaper and technology makes things easier. And also the consum and, and then came the consumption. Then came these DSPs. I mean, remember when they first started, people weren't sure how to use them, they were getting sued, but now they're here to say. So now how people how you can get your music onto Spotify, like if you're a home musician, you could literally I think there's some free services you can just distribute right to right to Spotify for free. That's amazing. Um, and this has to do with the DSP background services and things like that. There's online marketing tools you can use. There's playlists and suggestions which help build your fan base. Now, the downside to this is we feel the admin side has been greatly underserved, and that's our side. Some of the reasons for this, it's not that glamorous, to be honest. It, it's complicated. Um, it's riddled and, you know, it, it's filled with red tape. It's it's been controlled by the 1% of the owners of the music industry, which are the, you know, the three major companies. And quite frankly, some of them don't want it to change because the one percenters are doing pretty well and, and they don't want the system to change. And this is a common thing in all industries, not just technology. We see it across the globe, right? The old players who are doing well don't want the new players to come into the market and change things. If they don't change things, it really affects the whole global, the ecosystem. But the one percenters want things to stay the same because they're making out good. And, and, and again, it, it, it's, a, it's a tedious part of the industry, but it's ultimately the last link in the chain to revenue to flow. So when I describe music production, music consumption, and music administration in that order, if the music administration part doesn't work, that last chain in the flow, it'll eventually go back and affect music production and consumption. Because if artists don't get the money that's owed to them, you'll see less artists making a living at this, which means less people, less kids, less artists, less creatives will say, hey, I would like to make an album. I think I got a shot at making a living at this. And then it affects consumption down the line. So, you know, it is underserved because it's not glamorous and it's not on the stage, but it's, it's what's going on behind the curtains, actually. It's what's driving, this really drives the music industry. I mean, can you imagine if the major artists didn't receive, only receive 50% of their royalties and, and they can never get to it? Why would they, you know, they might stop doing what they do or might do other things. So 
all things are equal. It's very important. But again, we're focused on this very complicated music administration section. We're a huge supporter of music production, music consumption. Most of the people at the company do have some sort of music background or come from the music industry. Um, not just in the tech, but we have other divisions uh, besides the technology uh, division. And uh, we all do have a core love for it. So, so this is where we found, like, we think, okay, when we were going off to set music into action, we're like, okay, this is an underserved market, has a lot of problems to solve, and is a growing industry. I mean, hugely growing. I forgot the numbers in 2020, but it's one of the largest digital, digital is one of the largest growing sectors in 2020 out of all sectors, it, which is obvious. People are at home, they're streaming like crazy. Um, I think what would be, so, so, so that's, so that's, that's how we see the overall industry. We see our sector being less served, but we see that as a good thing for us because our job is to solve problems and we want to be a valuable service. So people really need a service like Muser. By the way, if this system worked perfectly, there'd be no reason for Muser. There'd be no reason for rights administrators. Spotify would be able to cut you a check every 30 days, drop it in your bank account, and it'd be extremely accurate with reporting to billions of people every 30 days. But obviously, they're not. that's not their focus, and it's never going to happen. So in a way, we don't mind being in this type of space. We find it to be challenging, and you know we want to... We want to have high goals, and our team is, is a team of experts, and we like to work on very challenging problems. Um, I will just end with this, that I think it'll be interesting to see how tech influences our tour industry and ticketing. I'm not an expert on that. I just want to throw it out there. I think that that's going to be interesting to see that. Absolutely. And I think after the entire conversation, it feels like um, we want intellectual property and um, the protection of intellectual property to maintain two things. One is the freedom of creativity, but also the right of the creator to be compensated for their work. So there should be free flow of ideas. Um, uh, there should something with which serves as an inspiration but of course we don't want to confuse inspiration with a right to create a derivative work without paying the owners so a question um for for some philosophers of in in our audience or in the listeners like human artists are also trained on the music of their peers and predecessors so if they are then inspired to compose new mu music that's a creative art but if an AI does it, it is truly creative if it's not genuinely adding something new, or is it? So in a dystopian future, I think musicians will be philosophers who also will be patent lawyers. Well, thank you so much, Paul. It was it was a pleasure having you with us. And I think um, we, we we explored a really uh, different angle uh, and, and uh, something new about the music industry. I think it's a very least explored industry and not many people know about how technology is actually playing, playing a huge role in the industry. So thank you for sharing your insight. It was a pleasure having you with us. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the time and uh, great questions. And uh, thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much. So for our listeners, watch this space for more podcasts and uh, you can head up to Spotify and Google Podcasts as well uh, to, to listen to our recent podcast. Thank you so much.